David Bohm Seminar Series 1, Saturday, November 4th, 1989, 5.30 afternoon session, Oak Grove School, Ojai, California. All right, well, perhaps we should discuss some more what has been we were talking about in the previous hour uh, at this point. Hmm. The question is, for someone who has lived a childhood that has been very traumatic and very dysfunctional in post-Nazi Germany and all of that, um, and has spent so many years in incoherent thought, and now is in a process of being more conscious, Is it possible ever to have coherent thought? Because it seems to me in the process of, of becoming more conscious, there are more and more thoughts of the past, of the experiences, and so on, which I wasn't conscious of for so many years. So I am wondering, is there a possibility of being, becoming, being sensitive, or mm -hmm. experiencing life really, truly, or is it just exchanging one thing for another thing, and so on and so on? Yes, I see your question. Uh, the, uh, I think the question has a very subtle meaning. <laughs> you see, that it's not on the surface, right? Hmm. See, if I... If you asked me to say, answer you, yes or no, it wouldn't mean anything, right? Yeah. <clears throat> you see. Uh, the, uh, so that can't be the meaning of the question. Right? <laughs> so, uh, so I say everybody has had that to some extent, right? Some more, some less. And because our whole society is incoherent and uh, our culture is incoherent, right? So, and we have this all on the record, all on the program, and we can, it then starts to come up and we wonder if we can ever get to the end of it. <laughs> uh, now, those thoughts will inevitably come up, you see. Now, you see, they have to first of all ask what are the alternatives, you see. <laughs> you see, one possibility is to say, okay, I don't think I can get to the end of it, I'll just give up. <laughs> But then you would go back into the old story. Hmm. Is that clear? That's one alternative. Uh, another is to ask a question. What about the thought that we are using in this very moment, this immediate present moment, to think about this and talk about it? Hmm. You see, is that coherent? <laughs> you see, usually thought hides, the incoherence of thought hides behind the most subtle thought of all, which is the thought at this very moment that we are using to think about the other thought. Hmm? That is the key, right? <laughs> is that clear? The thought that is happening right now, if that is incoherent, then all that we think about may be incoherent. You see, so we ha that's a very important question, that that's usually the way in which we have been kept in the trap. In the very thought with which we try to think about all our difficulties, we are using the same thought that is the source of our difficulty. Hmm? You see, so that's often, so often happened. Now, uh, see, so uh, let's try to look at it that way. Uh, uh, you see, we have all these traumatic experiences, and but we know how and um, how difficult they are. But finally, say, where are these experiences? You see, they have gone, right, in reality. They're there on the record, right? Now, if I made an analogy, you, you could have this all on a videotape. And watching the videotape, you could feel very bad. Huh? Right? And then you turn off the videotape, and it's gone, right? You see, that's just a, a, an analogy. Huh? That we don't know how to turn this off, right? <laughs> now, 
but still, we have to be careful not to give it too much value, you see. Uh, if we can once see that it, it has no great value, that's already a step. It will not work so much. You see, this thing fills our mind with the whole program, but it may be something very small. Do you see what I mean? It's something... See, what about memory? Where is it? You see, nobody knows for sure. And it may be something very tenuous, very uh, gossamer, you see, very much more tenuous than any web of a spider. And it, it, uh, but still, it produces all these results which look very powerful, like the program. So if we could see memory for what it is, then we could say it's really something very small. But if we once assume that these things are real and true, then we are, and we'll have to come to that more later, then we are caught in it, right? You see, if we ask a question which is coming out of the assumption that what memory presents is real and true, then we are caught in that whole thing. Is that clear? See, so we're going to have to ask how we, is it really, is, is it real and true? And at least we can see it's not all that important. So later on, I'll try to discuss how to go into all that, right? You see, see this, uh, uh, to question the reality and truth of all that. See, if it is not real and not true, then it has no value. Now, that may seem very hard to give up all that, <laughs> right? Could you say more about how you, how you speaking of real and, and true well, in the historical sense? Well, just simply, let's take a traumatic experience that you've had in the past. Maybe it was real then, you see. Even then it wasn't entirely really what you thought it was. Right? You, know, you formed conclusions. Now, that is gone, but the record is still there, and it's, you relive it as if it were still there. So, but it's not, not real. Right? It's Somatically not... Especially. What? Somatically. Somatically, it's, Somatically it's being relived, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and there's, a, a, there's a judgment behind it that the thought that is telling you about this is true which backs it up. Now, the, we have to get free of that. Now, I think it's a little early for us to go into that, you see, further. Uh, we, we, I think we should... Uh, there are a number of things which have to be brought up to be able to go into that, right? Hmm? So how you would question this whole structure in, a, in an effective way. <laughs> now, I think that there are some things that are not exactly methods or anything, but that there's some sort of uh, suggestions you can, we can make as to what, what you know, how to approach it. Right? But I think I would like to put that off for a little while. But I would merely say that I think that, in principle, it should be possible for us to get free of all that for the reasons that I have said. which doesn't guarantee, of course, that anybody will do it, right? <laughs> In doing that, though, then aren't you using a thought to, uh, to dispel another thought? And so I'm using a thought to question another thought, you see, which is always the way thought works, to, to show the contradiction, right? See, I, see, I'm not saying we mustn't use thought because that would uh, be again that would become impossible. But rather, we are, see that's a point we discussed last year that there are thoughts and then there are thoughts about thoughts. Right? And the world is our whole culture is full of thoughts about thoughts, which many of which are wrong. But we can use thoughts about thoughts to call attention to the whole way it's working. Thoughts but about what? And thoughts about thoughts. And, and thoughts and so on. It makes a kind of map of the process, and then eventually that won't work unless we can move beyond that map, right, into the territory, right? Now, we have, so, in fact, uh, we'll try to come 
later to say that it's an artificial thing to say here is thought and here is non-thought, you see. That's a, uh, two extremes, right? We're really always in between. And the, uh, well, the, you see, for example, we were discussing at the end of the last hour that thought itself is part of the immediate. I think it was put by Hegel like this, that thought is mediation, but the mediation, the process of mediation is itself immediate. But we don't see the process of mediation. The whole point of thought is to give you the, the, the content, right? the, right? to put your attention on the content, not on the process. Right? That's one reason why we get so lost. Right? You see, that, that's the whole way it's in, almost designed to work. Right? And yet, in a Stone Age, it probably worked all right, but we, we're now getting to a point where it doesn't, you see. Now, the... Uh, uh, so we have to say thought is an immediate is part of the immediate the immediacy of actuality, right? Uh, but we don't see it as such generally. Uh, but uh, uh, the mistake that is occurring always is that thought does not see itself its product as thought as the result of thought. But since it doesn't see how it comes about, in fact, it's almost designed not to see that, then when the result comes, it immediately says, that's something else that I must, it's my problem that I must solve, right? right? That has been always the basic mistake. And it's fundamentally, it comes also to the observer, the observed, or the distinction of the thinker and the thought. I don't know if we should start that right now, because that might be a long discussion. Uh, and the, uh, so... Uh, uh, yeah, so uh, that means that thought has a place, thinking has a place, right, right, in going into this, right? Actual thinking, hmm. not automatic thought, right? <laughs> uh, but uh, there's always some automatic thought in every thinking process, too, right? So uh, there's never the sharp extremes, right? We're always somewhere in between. Uh, and the question is, can we move coherently in this in-between area? <laughs> right? Uh, now, I don't know what would be the be next best step, but I mean, does anybody want to discuss, uh, raise any more questions about this first? So, thought by nature defines whatever is being presented. The whole situation becomes automatically limited and it looks very, very difficult to escape. While if you were saying, staying coherently whole, all the possibilities are there till we, we conclude that whatever <coughs> happened, happened. And that seems to be part of the trick. Well, thought presents this apparent uh, independent reality because thought presents its con results as immediate, and it's the thing you think about which you are conscious of, right? Not thought. <laughs> In the first thinking process, you are not conscious of thinking, right? When you begin to think about thinking, then you are conscious of the thinking you once did, but the thinking you are doing at that moment again <laughs> is not conscious, right? Is that clear? You see, you're not in contact with the actual immediate actuality process of thinking, right? <laughs> now, and then whatever appears has some aspect of, uh, uh, in which you don't quite, you may miss the fact that it is thinking hmm, or thought. Hmm? There's always that danger, and once you make that slip over, then you start that whole thing going, huh? Are we talking about the time lag now that you, you discussed before? Well, there is a time lag there, yes, in the sense that it takes time to think about it, and what you've thought about is gone, right? <laughs> now, you usually assume, that's true in every case, you see, all experience, but you assume the thing you think about hasn't changed very much, right? Like the table. Hmm? But now thought is changing very fast, and not only that, it has changed profoundly by the very moment 
of thought itself, right? Thought itself participates and makes a change in itself by how you think about it, right? So the thought that you are thinking about, not only it's an abstraction and you only see a bit of it, but it has been changed. So that the thought that you have now may not be the thought that you're thinking about. Or it may be, or may, some, some features may continue and some may not. The very act of thinking about it changes it. Yes, and in some cases, some, some of the things you could think about may be continuous and some may not, right? It's like a tape running and in one second it's not the same. It's mm-hmm. Yeah, but it, not only that, but the attempt to do some, to observe it changes it. You see, that's what also holds in quantum theory. <laughs> you see in physics, right? Yeah. Thinking being a material process is being changed also. Then. Yes, it's being changed in the cells of the brain, you see. And the blood supply. Hmm. So somatically we need Yeah. Is the path for us uh, to stay in coherent thought, to just be ready to constantly recognize our mistakes, our contradictions. Well, that's that's part of it, but then possible? you'll find you can't do it. That's see. what I was wondering. How will you stay in coherent thought? You see, we're exploring. Now, the next point is saying, I'm not telling you what to do, you see. <laughs> I'm trying to point out some things I see, but I cannot tell you what to do now. <laughs> but, except in some vague general way, right? So the next thing is you discover, I suggest do this. You must tell me what happens. You've told me. You can't do it, right? <laughs> Which doesn't surprise me. <laughs> yeah, so what will we do then? <laughs> I mean, it seems reasonable, but you can't do it, right? <laughs> well, what holds uh, an incoherent activity? There must be an awful big payoff all the time there to stay with that. It's to stay with what? Being incoherent. I mean, you want to stay with con- being aware of incoherence, or with. The- well, mankind has stayed with that. Uh, well, yes, it's it's been something there for him. Like yes, that. well, obviously, it's self-interest is one thing. You see, getting pleasure, getting uh, the hope of the reward that it will come later, or something, right? Hmm? Yeah. <laughs> Someone says they can't do it. Is that a correct statement, or is it more correct to say they are not doing it? Well, we, I would say I haven't been able to do it. I find that I was not able to do it. You see, now that would be correct. That doesn't mean I can never do it. But it may give you clues about the way you're going about trying to do it. Yeah. Also, the way you, the way you attach meaning to the statement, I can't do it, in, in your program, that may mean I can never do it. If it means that, you block yourself. You see, see how subtle it is that by just giving it that meaning, you have thrown yourself off and it's absolutely impossible from now on. You see, one little thing and you've ruined it. Right? <laughs> so you've got to be awake and alert. Right? And then you'll say, I can't be. Right? <laughs> Thought is always putting me to sleep. <laughs> It's like that Zen thing again, right? So if there's anything to do, then it's not it. Well, I don't know. I mean, maybe there's something to do, but we haven't found it, if there is, right? We, you see, we mustn't make an... Uh, the next thing I suggest is don't make any assumptions which you cannot, uh, which are unfounded, right? So. It seems so, but what seems so may not be so. You see, uh, you can't... You can't uh, act on what seems so, you see, in this, you see, uh, because the whole process of thought is to produce uh, appearances, seemings, right? Thought can make anything seem like anything, right? <laughs> Would we say that we have to find together the kind of experience that will eventually uh, liberate us from that uh, program? Well, I don't know whether it's an experience or not. We have an insight, perhaps, that will liberate us from the program, right? And I'll just make a suggestion that this insight, as Krishnamurti says, may change the brain cells. The program, in some way, affects, has affected the brain cells, too. In fact, some people have claimed to have shown recently that memories are, in, at least in some part, laid down by connecting up the brain cells in a certain way in a, sort of a hardwired circuit. <laughs> and uh, that may not be all of it, but the less subtle memories, let's say. And... Uh, in that case, you may be stuck with that circuit, you see. <laughs> so you keep on doing it even though you don't want to do it, right? Hmm? 
But then, are those circuits really fixed, or perhaps they're only relatively fixed, right? Perhaps insight could change them. You see, thought changes them. <laughs> thought is changing them every minute, isn't it? Thought created them. <laughs> they say that infant brain has very few of those circuits, huh? Only the instincts, right? So thought created the circuits, so th thought may, uh, maybe thought uh, can, can changes them too, but it cannot change them in a coherent way because it doesn't, it can't, for all the reasons I explained, it can't keep up with it, it doesn't, it's confused, you know, it's incoherent uh, and so on, you see. So, but perhaps there's an insight that could change them. That's a suggestion. I'm not saying it exists, you see. Just simply to open up the mind. You're saying that, see, one of the points is thought limits your mind by saying this will never happen, you see. The brain cells once given a circuit, they've got to stay in that circuit forever, right? But that may be not. It is very comfortable when it has it sets rigid dogmatic conclusions. Mm -hmm. Then so it feels kind of very comfortable. Yes, well that's true because it gives you a sense of security to know that I, <coughs> I really know, right? <coughs> but that that's another one of those seemings of thought. You see, you don't know when you don't when it's, you seem to know, right? See, so you have to be very sensitive and say, Do I really know? Is this assumption really right? Huh? It, or is it an assumption, or is it a truth, right? Knowledge in, in terms of knowledge <coughs> experience, but... Well, I, and I, it may not be entirely true, you see, this assumption, right? Whatever, you have to be, you see, be careful. Hmm? Because any such assumption can just block you altogether. Dr. Bowman, are we talking about trying to change thoughts that we have that are causing us um, problems? Well, but the, the problem, uh, it's more fundamental than that. We're trying to understand the whole process, which I'm getting to the root, right? to the source of the pollution. And we're not trying to change any thought, but we want to see what's going on. And I'm suggesting that insight by itself may change it. That all thought is polluted, or just some of our thought is polluted. Well, it's all mixed, you see. In the memory, it all gets mixed, and you can't separate the polluted thought from the unpolluted thought. The same as with the computer virus. Nobody knows how to separate the virus program from the rest of it. Is it advisable to try to separate it first or not? Because if you're trying to get rid of something that's a virus, you really don't want to get rid of the stuff that isn't a virus. That's true, but you can't. You don't know how to separate it because your thought is not subtle enough to see the difference. I guess back to what you were saying before about trying to stop the pollution at the source, and yeah. that the river will eventually clean itself on the yeah. Yes, if we stop pouring it in, the stuff will eventually go right. When thought realizes it can't solve its own problems, Chris and Bernie used to talk about getting to the end of thought. In other words, reaching a point where you, you stop because there's nothing that you can think about anymore. Is that what we're talking about? Well, that's a suggestion. You see, what I'm trying to say, you have to be careful because thought may pick that up and say, okay, that's what I'm going to do. Yeah. <laughs> you see, the, uh, it's very tricky, right? So you go back to the question, who is doing it? Yes, and what is it meant by me, and you and I, and so on, right? You see... So uh, there are many questions involved there, you see, that uh, which are really not our individual incoherence, but it is the collective incoherence of the whole culture over thousands of years, right? All those ideas arose, not, they were not invented by any particular person, and they didn't arise in a short time, right? Hmm? But don't they become a part of each of us then, and so we, all, we each own it? We each are it, you see, but at the same time, we needn't be it forever. Right, but uh, if we look at it only collectively, and then we're saying, all right, let's collectively change the collective part of it, but maybe if we change the, do something about the individual part, it will eventually affect the collective. So That's right, yes. Do we have to get rid of that I, or can we say, let's look at that as an I, and then it might, it'll affect this one, this one, and this one? Yeah, what I mean by the collective thought is that each individual is conditioned by the collective thought, so it's a part of him. Right? That, in fact, the most fundamental conditioning of the individual is the collective thought. 
Uh, each person will find that thought in his own thought, right? Right. But if he if he says that's me, then he can't see it. You see. If he says that's mine, I, I you know, uh, uh, peculiar to me, right? Hmm. Uh, right. So uh, I'm trying to point out that there's a subtle question there that see uh, there isn't time really to do the uh, to discuss you know how we would go into this to uh, look deeply but i want to give some of the background right? hmm. now just the background of it is this that thought is a real process that is concrete actual process along with everything else hmm. we but thought we don't thought doesn't see this and we generally don't see thought as such the whole point of thought is to not make that process invisible and to make only the result visible, right? Hmm? Now, we have got somehow to come in contact with that process, right? Uh, if it's to change. Now, we say, how will we do that? I'm saying that this will come if we can get close to the source of it, hmm? rather than way down the line on particular thoughts. Now, the source of it could be found by taking thought in general rather than particular thoughts. Does that, if you pick on a particular thought, then there'll be a lot of other thoughts which you're not considering, which will have the same pattern. Hmm. So, hmm? Can't, can't you gain access to the general through the particular thought? There's really no other way, is there? Yes, but if you stick to a particular thought, you won't get to the general. But that's where you begin. You can begin, but then you've got to look for it to be more general, you see. Right? So we have to say w the source of thought would be close to the most general, to a very general kind of thought, rather than a particular thought. Now the matter is, don't you start with the particular and build up from that to the general? And wouldn't we do the same thing here, or am I using the wrong? Well, I'm trying to say that that's what we do very often, but it won't work here. You see, and in fact, it doesn't always work in mathematics either, because new ideas have come from insights. You see, so the uh, 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 in certain area that works very nicely, but in another area it doesn't. You see, now I, I'm trying to say that we, if we try to build up to the general, then we will be using the same process of thought. There's still more general thoughts which are used to build it up. <laughs> Is that clear? We are tacitly accepting the whole system and everything we do, and therefore we're not getting anywhere. You see, we have got to begin to look to the general. To include all thought, if possible, you know, as much and without restriction, and saying that this process could affect the whole of thought. We have to understand some properties of the whole of thought, right? Of, of its total and all of thought, and get some insight into it. You see that? You mentioned last year about categories of similarities and differences. Yeah. Isn't that one of the basic elements of how the brain actually works? You form images, how you talk and think. Maybe maybe what we are and what nature is, it can't be divided up into categories that are similar or different. Maybe there's a continuous flow, like you said. Maybe the whole structure of what the brain is actually doing is uh, wrong right from the beginning. Well, we say that, but it can work in a certain area, you see. Now, I'm trying to say we, we Perhaps, but when we get, we, we may have to change our approach as we try to do this deeper thing, you see. That we, we, were, we are trying to get to thought, the source of thought, right, in general. Hmm. Right? An example of the general kinds of thought you mean? Well, thoughts about thought. We're doing it right now, you see. We're saying, what about, what is, what is the nature of thought, right? We're saying, what, what thoughts are concrete, are they abstract? <laughs> We're discussing thought in general. Is that clear right, right now? We're not saying, you know, the thought I had yesterday is abstract, or the thought about my country is abstract, but rather thought is abstract, right? When you use the word thought without anything else attached to it, you mean thought in general, hmm. right? Uh, now... Can I watch to what's happening in the brain? When we raise the question, what is the source of the thought? Because as, w as the watching takes place, I can see that there is a, a tendency of the jumping of the computer to give an answer. And on the other side, there is something that says, stop. <coughs> so there is wait and stay with the question. 
And maybe that thing with question may invite the insight. Yes, if you can stay with the thing and, and then thought constantly wants to move away from a question that might be disturbing, right? it has in it the urge, you see. So uh, we want to get to this, to something more general. Now, I'm trying to say that that an ordinary experience, the general is more abstract, right? Like you say, here's a chair and a table and so on, and then furniture is more general and more abstract. Now, as far as the idea is concerned, the general idea is more abstract. But in the concrete process, the general is the most concrete. <laughs> is that clear? So the general is more encompassing. Yes, that's right, but it encompasses in the usual language very abstractly. You see, furniture is far less concrete than the table. So, and so far as the ordinary language is concerned, the general is abstract. But when we come to the process of thought itself, at its source, which is where it's generated, the general is the most concrete. You see, then it, it, it divides into different uh, thoughts. We haven't yet come to this source, have we? No. Okay, because yeah. I thought maybe I missed that one. No, no. We're <laughs> getting at something very subtle. Yes, yeah, so we don't know. I'm not guaranteeing we're ever going to come to it, you see. I would say maybe we will, maybe we won't. I'm saying if you want to come to it, this may get in the way. Is that clear? This desire. <laughs> Is that clear why it gets in the way? That will get in my way, okay. Yeah. You see, it produces more thought, which is just the thing you want to get away, get away from, you see. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what I said before. <laughs> you see, uh, see, uh, see, we have then, see, look, we need another attitude, you see, saying, we don't know whether it's going to work or not. Uh, say, but I think if we give up on this, we know it's going to happen. <laughs> Could you say something about how one would experience as territory the general concrete rather than as an as an as part of a map? Well, I think you we have to experience it. You see, how will you? experience and insight, I don't know, you see. Uh, you see, let, let's try to put it, are you experiencing, say, suppose I talked about the concrete and the abstract, as I did, right? I said the concrete is more subtle, right? And, the, and that's the, that turns it around from the usual language, right? And then I said, how do you experience, do you experience that? Can you experience in this room that our concrete relationship is a subtle flow and not a lot of defined little things. Eh? Hmm? You see what I'm driving at? A subtle flow which contains everything, all the little separate things are all contained in the subtle general flow. But general as concrete general, not as abstract general. Is that clear what I mean? Eh? Yeah, well, that's, that's the part that I think needs the most stress. Otherwise, yeah. Yeah, you see, I describe it general meaning abstract usually. And, the, and from the point of view of the idea, it is abstract, right? The more general idea is more abstract. But then I say, this switches over, that the concrete process itself, which includes everything that's going on here, is the general, see the word general has the same root as generate, eh? is the process from which it's being generated. And now, the, this may, I mean, I suggest maybe you get the sense of something moving among us and between us from which it's all being generated, which in, brings it all together, all the bits, right? Hmm? Hmm? Would you identify general with explicate? No, general, it depends on which way. General here is implicate, generative. The concrete general is implicate, you see. So it's enfolded, you see. So. But we are going to come, we are going to make it, a, say, the immediate experience. Uh, the immediate experience of the general, of the generative, you see, uh, is the experience of the concrete which holds us together, the, the, the glue, the cement, right? <laughs> you see, 
I'm saying that I'm, I suggest, I hope I'm not just uh, uh, hypnotizing you into this. <laughs> uh, the, uh, yeah, I mean, even if you get the faintest whiff of it, that would be enough for the moment, right? Do you see what I mean? Huh? Do you differentiate between uh, creating and thinking? Well, I say right. the creative. Talk about insight. Yeah, the creative act, act is beyond thinking. Yes, but uh, it may, but it may take make use of thinking, right? Right. But if, um, if, if the insight is uh, the way you're talking about neural connections in a very sort of hard way, a, a leap that requires connections that aren't normally there to be something different mm -hmm. and. Um, so then if what you say is instead of trying to think about this problem, let's see if we can find some way to you know, be more creative with it. In yeah, but, then, but your whole way of putting it denies the whole thing, you see. Let's try to be is a kind of thought which would put you in the wrong frame of mind. You see, we, uh, when we try to be it, we are already in the other frame of mind, you see. So I'm saying let's not try to be it. <laughs> See, we have got to have another attitude, which is, though we realize its importance, we're not going to try for anything. In, in the not trying, one is open to the possibility. <coughs> yeah. In the not trying. Yeah, and that we are open to this thing. We have an empty space, and we're open for, it to... for something to happen, you see. Now, we are not trying because we don't know exactly what we want anyway. And, uh, you know, it's subtle and unknown and so on. So... Uh, uh, it may happen, it may not happen, but you see, our main interest has to be in something else, which is, what is it? Do we see, do, are we interested in this process itself? You see, I, as a scientist, if you said my main purpose is to make a great discovery <laughs> and get the Nobel Prize, <laughs> you see, uh, uh, but you say, no, I got so interested in this thing that I forgot about that, right? <laughs> Right. So you're saying it's the process, just go with the process? Well, you'll become interested in the process itself. You see, now, the word interest means to interesse, to be in between, right? To be in it, right? I'm thinking, like, sometimes when I get involved in something that I'm doing, I lose sight of everything. Yeah, well, could we be you see, in that state about this thing? Could we do that in regard to the thing we're talking well, about? Is that what you're saying? So yeah. To lose sight, you don't know who you are, what time it is, or... Yes. That's what you're saying. Okay. Yeah. Now, that, then, they might, then something might be discovered, you know, something might happen, right? So, uh, we need this interest, and now interest arises because you see the great value of something. But this thing is a value not only because of the result it produces, or it may produce, but also in itself, it's very, it's of great value, right? And just to, to see it. Sometimes some of the things I do that way, I do it because I, I enjoy it. In other words, it feels yeah. good. Well, that may, maybe you'll enjoy this too. <laughs> maybe not. You see, <laughs> but uh, you see, you can't say. Suppose you say that. The question of coherence is closely related to the question, say, beauty is a kind of sense of coherence, right? A harmony order, right? And uh, if you see the beauty of nature, you see it may absorb you for that moment, right? But maybe this whole thing would have something similar if you could see it. Hmm? So that you would be inter interested in it, not for the sake of the result. But the result is added on, you see. <laughs> I don't know what, if this is special relevant or anything, but a little earlier I had a... Uh, when you're talking about the general, what what I, I get or what I had a sense of was um, how all of us here as individuals, um, we're all... Everybody's expressing a particular point of view, but what's common about all of that is that it's all based on knowledge. And that somehow there's like a common 
pool of knowledge and then in, sort of individuals arise up out of that pool and say, well, this is what I see over here. And then somebody else says something and now I'm saying this. And it's sort of this thing is going on, but it's all coming out of a body of memory kind of thing. And, and, uh, yeah, I right, could look at it that way, yes. Uh, I think there's more than that. Though. What would you say is more? There's, there's a natural interest that we have mm-hmm. in whatever this is. There's something that you can't put in thought that it motivates there's something tacit. There's someone here from Germany, I'm from Houston, it's kind of just some thing that's deeper than just thought. Yeah, think. okay, but they're both present. I mean, there's, there's the response from knowledge and there's some deeper in, is intention. It, is it from the meaning that's flowing amongst us? Well, yes, I should think so, yeah. That, that there be a meaning flowing amongst us, which we'll discuss. Uh, you see, this is the basis of dialogue, that meaning that flows among us, right? And uh, the uh, uh, now, if we can share this meaning, see, participate together in it, we will have a common meaning and a common mind, right? Hmm. But that can go either way, right? What? Well, that can the, the, the content of that meaning uh, could go in any direction. It's yeah. Intrinsically, uh, apart from thought, there could be shared common. Oh yeah, we. Yes, that's right. We could share meaning of thought too. I mean, that's quite all right too. You see, but it may not be all right. It may not if the thoughts are incoherent. But uh, you see, but we would then have to be able to share the uh, the acknowledgement of incoherence. <laughs> Is not one of the obstacles the um, reluctance for most people to acknowledge that their thought is not exactly original, and that it's um, well, I don't want to say original, but that it's common and that it, you know, is duplicated in other minds. I've had the experience where I've had conversations with people where they're actually, say one is discussing a certain subject, um, the words, the thoughts are parallel to mine and to other people. And it's almost a shock because you thought maybe it was original, but it isn't. It seems to be a program that other people share. And in the uncovering of that, it uh, again verifies this the program and it, the strength of it. And uh, for people of different countries, in particular. Well, that can be, can be present, you see. But that's another assumption that you've got to, you know, that thought you've got that you are original or that you've got to be original. You see, the society may have communicated that assumption that you ought to be original, right? And that you're not really good if you're not original, and so on. In other words, you can't maintain your self-esteem unless you can believe you're original. <laughs> now you see it, but then you have to say, okay, uh, now which is more important to do that, maintain your self-esteem, or to see the meaning correctly? Huh? Now, see if you can say. Uh, it's it's really more important to see what it means correctly, though there's a tremendous resistance to that. And then we are on the right track anyway, you see. Hmm. Uh, now, the whole society is a, a works by not wanting to see those things, by, you know. You brought up the, I'm sorry. Go ahead. You brought up the point that thought is time that if one can observe thought or be aware of it, one's observing time. And if one is aware of thought as time, one is also more aware or maybe make some kind of contact with the timeless so that one can both have the timeless and time. Yes, well, I, 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 we discussed that in a small group we had outside there. Uh, I'm sorry, I was seeing a relationship. Yeah. To what you were saying before. That yeah. My and what was it? Well, that the the point of of observing uh, thought is as uh, the point is to observe thought that that's the uh, dynamic which liberates one from the whole of thought hmm. without losing the value of thought mm-hmm. and brings one. To contact with something that one needs to be in contact with. Yes, I think you see we 
I think that we could end, uh, focus on that note without bringing in time right now because that would be a long story. But the uh, uh, yeah. Let's say now we've been sort of going into some general notions and also trying to look at the whole problem, right? You know, as a uh, now, you know, seeing it in this very generative way, right? Now, what's stopping us from getting very far in that is just simply that thought works as a program and it, it, it mixes itself in everything we do as we try to do that, right? Is that clear? That we, we may begin to outrun ourselves if we try to go too far, too soon, right, on this direction, right? So we may have to go back a little and say where we were before and saying we, are, we know now we have this incoherent thought, but we don't know that we are having it or we don't know we're doing it when we do it, right? So how will we get to be aware of that? Now, see, one of the points was to say, watch the, uh, to be sensitive to the state of the body and the emotions and so on, you see. Right? Uh, then, uh, this, see, that is part of the concrete situation. You see, you're saying thought arises in this concrete way, which is subtle and tacit, just like riding the bicycle. You know, you don't, you only see the results of thought of the process and not the process. Hmm. But if you can make a connection between these results and some other parts of thought, you will begin to get a notion of the process. Is that clear? Hmm. Now, one of the results of thought is that your body, all these things happen in your body hmm, that we talked about. Right? Now, the difficulty, you say, oh, let's be sensitive to them. You see, that's good, right? There is a problem there still, which is that you don't all know that you are thinking, usually. You don't know the thought is taking place. Right? Very often you do know you're thinking, right? Because you say, I want to think. Huh? You have the intention to think, and then you think, right? Hmm? Say, I have the intention to move my hand, I move my hand, and I know that I move it, right? I have the intention to think, and thoughts appear. I say that, therefore, those thoughts are clearly thoughts. <laughs> hmm? Is that clear? Hmm? But then suppose thoughts spring up from memory out of, and, and they just simply affect my body. I could be sensitive to it, but I won't know what it means. I could just say it looks to me as if my body is affected, is something wrong with, you know, something is going on there. Is that clear? I've got to see what it really means. Huh? Now, unless I know that I'm thinking, I cannot connect thought to the state of the body or to the emotions. Huh? But a great deal of this thought goes without knowledge that you are thinking, and that thought is taking place. Huh? Is that clear where the difficulty is? But sometimes even if you know that it's thought that's affecting you, it doesn't mean you're going to be able to um, find out what that thought is. Well, I'm going to try to make a suggestion about that, you see. Right? Now, it's true what you say. Now, the, uh, even though you know vaguely you're thinking, you don't know what the thought is. And if you don't know what the thought is, it's still not going to tell you very much. <clears throat> now, see, so we'll, we'll start on this now. And Oh, unfortunately, it's 6.30. <laughs> uh, uh, well, I'll just give a brief beginning, and we'll try to go into it again tomorrow, you see. Uh, the... Uh, You see, let's take the case of being angry, you see. Your body is affected by being angry. Your heart beats faster. You feel uncomfortable and so on. You, you can feel the tension. You can feel the emotion, right? And, and you can watch what happens to your heartbeat and your blood and so on. You see, you see so you could say, I'm angry. You know, you may get angry in a burst of anger, but you cannot go on being angry unless you have a thought which justifies the anger, which says you have a valid reason to be angry. And I've discussed this many times before. Like if you are somebody, you have made an appointment to see somebody and he is there an hour or two late, you're starting to get angry. And 
saying, how can he treat me this way, and so on. And then suddenly he appears and says the train was late, and you say, okay, that's a good reason, the anger goes. Or if you say, I don't believe you, <laughs> it gets worse. Huh? <laughs> so the, uh, you can see now that thought is involved directly in maintaining anger. See, it's a direct proof that the state of the body and the emotions is affected by thought. <clears throat> Now, uh, but now, <clears throat> suppose you've had this this reason for being angry or some other reason. Uh, for at first, it may be too powerful for you to do anything, but it simmers down. It's still there, but uh, you know it, it, it's not that powerful. Right? Now, what you can do, and this is a kind of exercise, <laughs> is to find the words that express the thoughts that uh, justify your anger. For example, he treated me. He had no consideration for me. He takes me for granted. He is always doing that. Uh, you know, he, he he had some trivial reason to, to do something else, and, <laughs> he, and he he missed. He just forgot about me. You see, and so on and so on. You can think all those thoughts. Find them. You see, it'll be different in each case. So find the words which express those thoughts. Right. And you will see the feelings of anger in the state of the body appearing. Right? Well, that <laughs> will be a direct proof that <coughs> thought is doing it, right? Well, not only that, but it makes it possible to see the connection between thought and the state of the body and the emotions, right? to get a sense of that connection, to be sensitive to it, so you can feel that the thought is connected to that emotion, but you'll also feel that emotion is affecting the thought. It, it doesn't. It, it's telling you, giving you the impulse. Don't give up this thought. Right? <laughs> uh, this thought may not make much sense, but don't give it up. You see, you may say, if I get angry with this person, we will have a fight. It will destroy everything we're doing. It's terrible, but still, I must. It's too important. I've got to remain angry. Right? <laughs> you see. So, uh, therefore, you see. Suppose you say uh, instead. Usually, you try to suppress those thoughts. Say, I shouldn't have them. Right? Suppose instead you say. I'm going to bring up those thoughts, but suspend them. I'm neither going to carry them out nor cover them up. Huh? But just look at how it all works. Somebody said if you say <coughs> this kind of angry emotions, uh, you just uh, suppress them. It's like save them. Like you put them with the money in the bag and you get interest. Yeah. <laughs> they will come later. They'll come later. They're, they're, they're in abeyance, you see, that they're, they're doing it put aside, right? Yeah. Now, uh, but they'll come back, you see. Now, the, the point is, though, here, let's bring them out. Don't carry them out. I mean, don't, uh, don't insult the person or something. But uh, by, by the words, the words will... See, they're there all the time on the program. They're affecting your body all the time, your emotions. But the words have been suppressed, right? Let, see if you can get the words out, you see. Then you know it's thought, right? If you don't... Yeah, but you can see directly in your mind it's thought because the words tell you that. You know? Then you can see directly that the words and the emotions in the body are all in one process, which is concrete. Hmm. Is it best to write them down? You can write them down too, but yes. Bring them out. <clears throat> bring them out, but the important thing is to watch what's going on, you see. Is that, excuse me, is that what psychodrama people mean when they say we fight fire with gasoline? Well, maybe they mean that. I don't know. You see, uh, I'm trying to say, though, that we're not trying to get rid of anger. You see, this is very important. We, we are trying, our purpose is to watch what is happening. See, getting rid of anger is rather a triviality. You could get rid of anger by simply believing this person's reason for being late, you see. <laughs> but what's happening if this person says, how do you dare to ask to, to, to credit that? Well, yeah, but, uh, it's it's well, an infringement of my freedom. I what, can cover whatever I feel like it. Yes, all right, but you're doing this after he has left and the anger has simmered down, you see. <laughs> uh, right? You see, uh, you probably can't do it while he's saying all those things. <laughs> <laughs> but now the purpose of this is not to get rid of anger. You see, that that would reduce it to a triviality, right? Uh, because you can get rid of anger in many ways, but uh, the the point is that it's a much deeper purpose, which is to become aware of how it all works. It's the beginning of an insight which can be liberating, right? You're saying do a, it's like an experiment, and you're doing yeah. a little experiment with yourself. Yeah. 
Yes, you're doing an experiment and observing the result, you see, and observing what happens, right? Just being a laboratory, our whole organism is a laboratory, yes. and at the same time, uh, we are scientists observing. You are producing, the, you're doing the experiment, you're producing the situation and observing what happens, being very sensitive to the... Now, the instruments are the body and the emotions, and the words, right? The words produce the situation, and the instruments are the body and the emotions, which are the thing you have to observe, right? Hmm? So we're saying don't suppress the body or the emotions, because that's just, it's like saying there are all sorts of, you know, meters or galvanometers all over the place, and they say you're supposed not to have them working, so you could, say the scientist could say, let me turn the galvanometer back to zero, because that's where it ought to be. <laughs> That would be a suppressing anger, right? <laughs> uh, so, but it, I mean, it doesn't mean a thing, right? So, therefore, the idea is let the galvanometer swing. It tells you something, right? See, the emotions are the instrument that tells you what's happening. The, the state of the body is the instrument that tells you what is happening. Yes, yeah, so well, that's important. Now, we'll go into that tomorrow. It tells you not only something is happening, but if you watch carefully, it tells you what increases it and what decreases it, and so on. You see, you begin to get more insight, right? First taste you're doing good use. Yeah, you're getting a sense of what it's all about, right? Well, you're the laboratory, but normally we don't see the laboratory. That's the problem. We're just we're the action in it, and we need to be also the observer of it. Well, we think we're the observer and observing. We think the anger is something going on there that we're looking at, but it, we, we, we're not looking at it at all when we do that. But, see, we want to say the concrete process of anger is what we want to look at. Now, we've got to get that concrete process. We have, it's going, actually, but we've, we can't see all of it because we've covered up a part of it, namely the thought, right? But that thought is crucial. Anger is a process that involves thought, emotion, and the body. The thought or the emotion of the body? Oh. What was first? It doesn't matter. It's that chicken and the egg. You see, it, it, it may be that it was a burst of emotion, or it may be you just thought about it. Maybe it was perfectly peaceful until you thought, how can he treat me this way? Yeah. <laughs> right? And then it blows up, right? You see, you could be sitting there very quietly and uh, talking to somebody, and suddenly you see what it means and you explode, right? Yes, you, you, then, you, then we'll have to go into it. You may not, I think we should bring, come back to this tomorrow because not only we can do this with anger, but with fear, with uh, jealousy or hatred, you know. It's much harder. Anger is easier because it's not quite that in, intense and not, not as subtle as some of the others, right? But even with the most, even with the most coarse aspect of it, anger, for instance, yeah. the simplest, there's still often great difficulty in what you call suspending it. Oh, yes, yes. I think we should bring this up tomorrow, you see, that perhaps we can go into it more carefully and uh, go into this whole uh, uh, question of uh, what we can observe, you see, because when you say look at anger, we say, what, what is anger? What shall we look at, right? What is the concrete process of anger? See, if you say look at the table, you see, you could look at this table, not look at the thought about the table, right? Now, but if you use the word anger, it produces a thought, which is what anger is supposed to be. That, and you see that thought inside you, and that's what you're seeing. Right? So you look at fear and jealousy and all those other emotions, general human emotions that we all feel. Yeah, I think it can be done, but uh, you'll have to be very... It, it requires a great deal of seriousness, in the sense that the mind constantly wants to move away from that, right? Camouflage, it was righteous indignation. Yeah. All sorts of things. You can say, this is righteous anger. This is justified, valid anger. I mean, I have very good reason to be angry. It's terrible what he did. It's injustice to me. It's injustice to somebody else. Uh, you see? Now, it may be for all we know, but saying that there's something more important than that, which is that the whole human race is moving toward extinction if we can't see this sort of thing. 
person in this world that we must not be angry. And by watching, let's see if we, there is an interference to suppress the anger. Yeah, what, what I may suggest is during the night, maybe you will find an occasion to try this. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. Okay. <laughs>